Good morning, and welcome in the name of Jesus Christ to this beautiful All Saints Sunday, which means it's a new month. For our new month, our second mile monthly giving emphasis is Pine Creek Camp. Uh, we do that twice a year. Um, first was in February and then November. Our goal is 1,000 for the year, 500 each time. We didn't quite make 500 back in February, so we got a big push this month, and uh, hopefully we can make our goal. Uh, we have two more weeks of our six-week study, Faithful and Inclusive, Wednesday evening at 6.30 or Tuesday afternoons at 1 p.m. What did I say? It says Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. You take a nap between services, that's what I do. So feel free to come either one, except the Tuesday one, it's done. Um, next Sunday is United Women in Faith Sunday, that's uh, formerly UMW, and the women of our UWF group will lead our worship services. Uh, their guest speakers will be Owen and Andrea Fury, if I pronounced that right, who will uh, share about their experiences as missionaries in Zambia, so it should be a a really good, uh, good fun time. Also, in two Sundays, November 20th, uh, we will be hosting the community Thanksgiving service put on by the Fellowship of Churches. It'll be 6 o'clock here, so uh, um, we will uh, uh, hopefully we'll have a good turnout from our own folks. We'll also uh, be calling some people because we'll need ushers and greeters. So uh, if you want to do that, uh, call the church office and uh, let Pam know. Are there any other announcements this morning? Oh, yes. Okay, so apple dumplings and apple crisp were made, and about half have been sold. Uh, if you're interested in one, two, or 20, whatever, um, Elsie will be in the kitchen following service. They also have some apples, fresh apples left over at a quarter apiece. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just amazed that y'all, I guess you were able to actually exchange enough air in there because it doesn't smell like apples anymore in the kitchen. Oh, do you know how good that smells? At least while they're peeling them and coring them. Another announcement. You know what time today? Two o'clock. Okay, high school. Two o'clock. They're putting on play or musical. Play, based on its clue, based on the uh, board game. So, ten dollars a ticket. Two o'clock this afternoon. I assume that's at the high school. That explains all those cars there last night. I always wonder well, what are they playing tonight. Any others? Okay, reminder to vote on Tuesday. You can also, one more day of uh, early voting Monday, tomorrow, down at the courthouse if you want to go down there. But uh, uh, take advantage of that opportunity. Um, one other minor announcement. I just had to work it in somehow. 
in case you missed it, um, the uh, Houston Astros won the World Series. Uh, oh, I, for, I was going to look this up. I've always, you know, there's always been the joke, it's the World Series, but it's only Major League Baseball. Um, these days, there's only one team from outside of the United States, and it's in Toronto. Uh, and, uh, but uh, there are now as many foreign-born players in Major League Baseball as there are American-born players. So I guess that kind of does make it a World Series. My daughter, Erin, who is far more fanatical than anybody else in the family over this, was, uh, is home this weekend. Uh, and uh, so it was quite noisy last night at the end of the game. And man, I'm sure, we, sure glad we could turn our clocks back so I got a little bit of sleep. <laughs> Any other announcements? If not, let us prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to the prelude. <laughs> Please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship taken this morning from Psalms 145. Every day I will bless you, O Lord, and praise your name forever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Your greatness, O God, is unsearchable. You fulfill the desire of all who fear you. You hear their cries and save them. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and bless your holy name forever and ever. Our opening hymn is I'll Praise My Maker. The words will be on the screen and in your hymnals on page 60.
please join with me in the opening prayer. We bless your holy name, O God, for all you servants who, having finished their course, now rest from their labors. Give us grace to follow the example of their steadfastness and faithfulness to your honor and glory through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. In our first scripture lesson, taken from the second chapter of Haggai, the prophet speaks concerning the construction of the second Jerusalem temple after the exile. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the Lord's word came through Haggai the prophet. Say to Judah's governor, Zerubbabel, and to the chief priest, Joshua, and to the rest of the people, who among you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Doesn't it appear as nothing to you? So now be strong, Zerubbabel says to the Lord. Be strong, high priest Joshua, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord. Work, for I am with you, says the Lord of heavenly forces. As with our agreement, when you came out of Egypt, my spirit stands in your midst. Don't fear. This is what the Lord of heavenly forces says. It's just a little while I will make the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the dry land quake. I will make all the nations quake. The wealth of all the nations will come. I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of heavenly forces. The silver and the gold belong to me, says the Lord of heavenly forces. This house will be more glorious than its predecessor, says the Lord of heavenly forces. I will provide prosperity in this place, says the Lord of heavenly forces. You may remain seated as we sing our hymn of preparation for the bread which you have broken. The words will be on the screen and in your hymnal on page 614. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. In our second lesson, taken from the 20th chapter of Luke, Jesus teaches about the meaning of resurrection for humans and what it tells about the person of God. Some Sadducees who deny that there's a resurrection came to Jesus and asked, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a widow but no children, 
the brother must marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first man married a woman and then died childless. The second and then the third brother married her. Eventually, all seven married her, and they all died without leaving any children. Finally, the woman died too. In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? All seven were married to her. Jesus said to them, People who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to participate in that age, that is, in the age of the res resurrection of the dead, won't marry nor will they be given in marriage. They can no longer die because they are like angels and are God's children since they share in the resurrection. Even Moses demonstrated that the dead are raised. In the passage about the burning bush, when he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He isn't the God of the dead, but of the living. To him, they all are alive. This is the word of God for the people of God. Gospel writers love these stories, I think. Luke, probably more than the others, but they are. They're in all the Gospels, these stories where Jesus, in such a loving and compassionate way, gets the better of those who are seeking to outsmart him. I say it that way because. One of the keys to these stories, why they're so powerful in the Gospels, is that most of them are trying to make a fool out of Jesus, teach him that he doesn't know as much as they do. And yet, Jesus always engages them. He could have simply dismissed the questioners, after all, they're really nothing more than scoffers and sarcastic accusers, but he never does. He takes on all comers. I think he probably hopes to, in a loving way, crowbar uh, an opening into their closed minds somehow. After all, Jesus has high standards for the leaders of his people. And he often shows his disappointment in how they are leading, but he never gives up. He never refuses to engage. But our job is to tread carefully. Oh, it's, it's easy to mock, make fun of those who question Jesus, Sadducees in this story. But that's not our task. Even though they want to humiliate Jesus, we don't humiliate them. We're not here to belittle them. We're not here to claim moral or religious superiority over them. Our task here is to experience Jesus again. And in that, to see ourselves more clearly as, as we are on the way being made into disciples of Jesus Christ. It does help, however, to really understand what's going on here if we get a little background on the beliefs of the Sadducees. There were several groups, sects, whatever, of Jews at the time. Not unlike, there's lots of flavors of Christians today. Sadducees were just one of at least a couple that are mentioned in the Bible and of many that are mentioned outside the Bible. And Luke tells us that the Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection.
What he doesn't tell us is that the Sadducees were, they were the well-off of the day. They're the ones that lived on the right side of the track, so to speak. They had position and authority in the community, mostly because they or someone in their family bought it. And so, if we're to believe Josephus, the Jewish historian of the first century, they were collaborators with the Romans so that they could keep their prestige. And you know, then, that that helps to make sense of this. When you have pretty much everything this world has to offer, why bother with anything beyond this world? When you can claim that you're rich because of God's favor and God's blessing upon your life, then... Why not just go all in on that? They they had a sense of eternity. The Jews had been kind of struggling with that idea for, well, a little more than 200 years, ever since the Greeks showed up. They had a well-understood concept of the afterlife. The Old Testament doesn't really speak to it. But for the Sadducees, what was important was not about anything that came later. It was about their legacy. And legacy goes through male heirs. What's important to them was that their name their named survived them. It's what you're working for. They didn't have the opportunity to to donate money so that that, I think you're up to 77th wing of Parkview Regional Hospital will have your name on it. You go to a college campus now and almost every building has a name on it. You're wondering, I wonder what they teach in that building because it used to say that on the side of the building. And, and, and now they're even naming parts of places. I, I know my school, Georgia Tech, when, when I went there, when my dad, when his dad, I was third generation, so my grandfather graduated in 1924, my father in 1950, me in 1983. And, and, and that whole time, if you went to a football game, it was at Grant Field. Well... Well, many years after I graduated, one of the winningest coaches in Georgia Tech's history named Bobby Dodd passed away, and, well, they had to do something, but this football stadium already had a name. So they named the field itself after him. It's the Bobby Dodd Field at Grant Field. Okay. And I guess you can do that because about the same time, right across the street from Grant Field was Grant Park. And I don't remember what name they put on it. We've only seen it once or twice, but it's now a parking garage. But it has somebody's name on it. They did the same thing for basketball. Years ago, after it had already been built and it was the Memorial Coliseum, Somebody named Alexander gave a bunch of money, so it became the Alexander Memorial Coliseum. But then they wanted to honor Bobby Crimmins, Georgia Tech's winningest coach. He's still alive. But when he retired, they named it Bobby Crimmins Court at Alexander Memorial Coliseum. At least they don't have court or coliseum in twice. That's how you do a legacy. You give money or you... In sports, you win lots of games, whatever. It's not hard to find that thing around us today, even churches. There are those who consider their wealth to be a sign of of God's blessing. 
And so they, they live their lives in, in a way to ensure that they, they leave their legacy, their stamp on the world. But you know, in this story, what, what may be the most recognizable thing is the approach used to challenge people who think differently. See, the Sadducees didn't show up to discuss Jesus' stance on the resurrection from the dead. They didn't want to engage Jesus in a discussion of what shape the kingdom of heaven will take in this world or the next. They came to make fun, to, to ridicule, to, to satirize the very idea that anyone would hold a view opposing theirs. Sound familiar in this election time? Earlier in the 20th chapter of Luke, Jesus had just gone a few rounds with the lawyers, scribes, the priests. They, for some reason, wanted, wanted to uh, talk to Jesus about the tax policy of the Roman Empire. Well, they gave up. And now Jesus is faced with this contingency of Sadducees. As he was engaging the scribes, he probably saw them. Their, their limousines had pulled up right over there. And they all got out in their fancy tailored suits, making their way as a little huddle, probably walking in step. He knew what was coming. And so when it came time, they, they had this this wild scenario they had concocted that wasn't designed to engage Jesus. It was designed to make belief in eternity look ridiculous. They weren't looking for an answer. There was, they were convinced there was no answer other than their own. Their only goal was to humiliate their opponent. So, Jesus, one bride, seven brothers, who owns her in eternity? That Jesus does that thing that he always does in the Gospels. He takes them seriously. Really, he, he listens to them and he responds as if they're asking him a, a a real question and they're looking for a, a real solution to a, a complicated, if not impossible, problem. They came to make a fool of Jesus and he addressed them as if they were open to learning something new. Well, the first thing Jesus wants them to learn is that people aren't property in eternity. Probably like them to know that people aren't property anywhere, but one step at a time, Jesus is practical. Wait, you're thinking. I was listening, and I don't remember anything in that scripture about property being mentioned. And you're right, the word's not there, but that's what's behind their question. Property and legacy. Who gets to live on? Whose name goes on in this imaginary afterlife? They're wondering. Jesus says, well, there is no giving away. There's no, there's no marriage in the afterlife because everyone is a child of God children of the resurrection and and therefore they they don't exist these women anymore these spouses just to produce children and if you think this is really old stuff remember henry the eighth
Something changes in the resurrection, Jesus says. Something that, oh, at best you barely understand. Having responded to their sarcasm, Jesus then does something else that he often does in these, these kind of conversations. He asks, he answers the question they should have asked. Had they decided to enter into to a civil conversation by asking, Jesus, what basis is there for believing in resurrection for the dead? Well, it would have been a whole different moment. Had they set aside their, their snark, their disdain long enough to, to ask a serious question and to listen, we might have had a very different model for how differences of theological opinion can be handled. That was the question Jesus wanted to ask. He wanted to meet them on their own ground. The other thing you need to know about the Sadducees is for them, only the books of Moses, the, the Torah, the first five books of our Bible, those are, those are the only things there that are, that are scripture, word of God. The rest of that stuff is history and commentary. Only Moses is authoritative for the Sadducees. I'm sure they did not li like to be reminded, well, that sounds just like the Samaritans. So, in Jesus' response, he turns to Moses. They don't believe what he says, they'll believe Moses. He says, even Moses demonstrated that the dead are raised. God is not the God of the dead, but the living. Uh-oh. How do we respond to that? Where do we go from there? What do you do when... When this person you're trying to trying to make look the fool takes your hero and shows him to be on the fool's side of the argument. It's just kind of hard to come up with a witty and withering reply. And Luke records no response from the Sadducees. Oh, if we read another verse, you, you'd see that someone replies. It's one of the scribes, those that had already been quieted by Jesus, but they're still there. They're, hey, maybe the Sadducees will get one in. But you see, the scribes didn't support the Sadducees. They supported the Pharisees. And so... One of them, at least, at this point, licked his finger, made a mark in the air, and says, score one for Jesus. Thinking, the enemy of my enemy, you know. Now, there probably was a response from the Sadducees. I imagine it was loud, and I imagine it was rather negative. Sure. They had read those verses before that Jesus was commenting on, but that's not what it means. No way. Could it? No. No. Surely not. Jesus likely never had any intention of convincing the Sadducees that they were wrong. But Jesus' entire ministry is all about planting seeds. That's why he used that image so often to describe the kingdom of God. You don't have to be a horticulturalist to know. You, you plant a seed, it takes a little while to grow. Just like an, an idea takes a while to set up residence in the consciousness, especially of someone who believes differently than you. 
Did Jesus change those Sadducees' minds with that little engagement, altercation? It's hard to know for sure, but maybe a seed was planted. A seed that that found a a crack, found a, a mind that was just barely beginning to open to seeing new ways in which the world around them and the creator of all that it is can be seen. Or maybe it was just a band of puzzlers coming with puzzles. This group came to Jesus with a riddle. It was it was a test. It was a test to, to check Jesus' orthodoxy as they, def- they defined it anyway. Just in case you don't speak Greek, orthodoxy literally means right thinking. The question is, who gets to define what's right? And in response, Jesus riddled right back at them. With the truth, as he knew it to be. So maybe there's a lesson we can learn here from Jesus. Engage folks wherever they are. I don't mean physically. And speak love to them, but in their language. And then let the Spirit work. Plant that seed. After all, we know we have an eternity to work with. So be it. Our response begins with our joys and concerns. Um, just have a couple of uh, updates. Um, uh, we got word that Mike Fellebaum, Diane Binkert's brother-in-law, passed away um, uh, week before last, August 27th. Uh, got an update on Dana Walter's grandson, Xander Frost. Uh, He's still in the hospital. It's going on, in, ending his third week, but uh, he is doing better and uh, hopes to be home soon. So uh, keep him in your prayers. Hospital bed's no place for a 14-year-old. Um, also, uh, uh, both uh, Terry and uh, Pam McKee are home with head colds. Something must have blown in yesterday, because if it didn't blow down, you know, it's great. I don't have any of my leaves in my yard anymore. I have all the neighbor's leaves in my yard now. Didn't go down. So are there any other joys or concerns to lift up today? Got one up here. Mike's on its way. Uh, this is Pat Meyer. I saw Alexa Mc- McCampbell, Jim's wife, yesterday on Zoom, and she said Jim is doing very well. The physical therapy people are very pleased with the way he's coming back from his knee replacement surgery. Okay, so Jim McCampbell making good progress following his surgery. Any others? Oh, over here, Pam. Pam Bart, this is actually a Facebook prayer request coming from Pam McKee. She says, our three-month-old great-nephew Oakland has a very serious eye condition and may have to undergo surgery to correct the problem. He has been transferred to Riley Hospital to be ready for surgery at any time. She's asking, please pray for Oakland's healing and prayers for the whole family are much appreciated too. 
Okay, so keep Oakland in your prayers. Hopefully that means he's over his pneumonia, but now he's got something new to deal with. Is that the only one on Facebook? Alan goes back to the doctor tomorrow to get stitches and staples out of his neck, and he's still tr struggling with lots of pain. My sister Kathy is Mike Fellabom's wife that Mike passed away was buried Monday. Kathy had knee replacement Friday, oh, wow. and she went with us to a wedding yesterday. Oh so my she's gosh! Doing really well, or else her pain hasn't wore off yet. Or she may have had it wore off yet. And Lenny Kenrod is. Um, oh. home with asthma, COPD, and a sinus infection. So I took her to the grocery store yesterday, and she probably shouldn't have been out because she was probably running the fever, but she's home. Yeah, so keep Winnie in your prayers. Sounds like she's having a rough time. Uh, that Kathy Fellabom? Okay. Any others? All right. Today we uh, celebrate All Saints Sunday. Uh, celebrate, oh, thank you, forgot that. Um, this week we pray for Victory Christian Fellowship and Pastor Tim Morbitzer. So uh, cards in the back if you'd like to sign that. So, for All Saints, um, celebration is always an interesting term. Um, if nothing else, um, we are mourning the loss still of, of these people. Uh, some were members of our church, some were related to members of our church. Um, at least one former pastor and one former administrative assistant. So. Quite a variety in the list today. Uh, the list is in your bulletin insert. Uh, it's a way to honor them. I will read the name. Um, we'll hear uh, one bell tolled for each name. Um, pause for a brief time for uh, any silent prayer you would like to offer, and then I will close us with. to the list of those who have died since All Saints Sunday last year. Ronald Wickern. Leonard Gaskill. John Mort. Anna Umet, Elizabeth Schilling, Marlene Sparrow, Deborah Kemper. Jean Hatch, Mary Louise Brighter Rice, Fred Kling, Karen J. Shockey Bussard. Nellie Karnoff, George Leffel, Nancy Taylor, Walter Penrod.
Harold Marks. Nan Gimmer. Helen Lecoq. Carol Moses. Reverend Fred Quay Bishop, Jr. Lindy Leibarger. Robin Spangler. Lulabelle Clapp. Barbara Lochner. Judith Helen Murphy. Brian J. Van Landingham. Shirley Bickle. Gloria Whiting. Mike Fellabom. Ralph Penrod. Let us pray. Lord, we give thanks that this cloud of witnesses still gathers around us. Their legacy is their life they live. what in, in their way they taught us. To aid us in our journey of discipleship. Give us thanks. Give us, Lord, to, to follow their example of their steadfastness and faithfulness. All to your honor and glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now I invite you to join together in our prayer of confession as found printed or found in on the screen. Let us pray together. O oh God, we long to rest in you, to trust in your goodness, in your care for us, in your abundant life. But we don't know how to rest, and we have forgotten how to trust. We seek material goods that we don't really need. We befriend people not always out of love. We ask questions of you that only try to prove our point, not to grow in understanding of your desires for us. Slow us down, Holy One. Attend to us, Holy One, and show us that you are our salvation and our resting place. Amen.
God is the God of the living. The Holy One will make a place for you that is full of life and love, forgiveness and humility, kindness and justice. Your belonging to God is your salvation. You may rest in that truth. Amen. We continue our worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings. Our offertory sentence this morning comes from the first chapter of James. After all, you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let this endurance complete its work so that you may be fully mature, complete and lacking in nothing. Let us consider these words as we give to God.
Lord, we give thanks that in all that you have given us, we can give to others and for the work of your church. May your blessings be upon these gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we prepare to approach the table, and for those of you watching online, gather your elements as you have. You need to remember that there have been those who have approached this table before us, many, many more than who we are. You've known a few of those, but They've been coming to the table for over 2,000 years now. And on this day of around the world, millions, if not billions of people, followers of Jesus, disciples, come to the table. That is the cloud of witnesses that strengthens us we may not know them all. We don't know them, their circumstances, but we do know that we are all called to a ministry that is far bigger than us, to a discipleship that requires every bit of us. On the night in which Jesus ate his last supper with his disciples. He took bread, broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take eat, this is my body given for you. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he passed it to them and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood given for the new covenant, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So likewise, we come as a holy and living sacrifice, giving of ourselves, giving of our selfishness, so that we might live in and with Christ. I invite the ushers to come forward. They will bring the elements to you and take your hand out. They'll give you the bread and hand you the cup. When everyone has been served, we will partake of the elements together.
cut over which we give thanks is the sharing in the blood of Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we give thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world the strength of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we sing our hymn of invitation. Come, let us join our friends above. The words will be on the screen and in your hymnal on page 709. Please join me in our blessing. Go now with courage, for God is with you. Do not let anyone deceive you, but hold fast to the traditions of the apostles, and put your trust in the God of the living. And may our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father who loved us, and through grace gave us eternal comfort and good hope, Comfort your hearts through the Holy Spirit and strengthen them in every good work and word. We go in peace to love and serve God in the name of Christ. And we go knowing that we are not the first to travel this path, but we continue both our journey and the journey of God's people in the love of God and in the name of Christ. Go in peace. Amen.